Anxiety and Politics by Franz L. Newman. Um, on January 6, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt proclaimed the four freedoms freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. But with the end of the Second World War, anxiety has not disappeared from the world. On the contrary, it has become even greater and more frightful. It has begun to paralyze nations and to make men incapable of free decisions. Anxiety is, or ought to be, a central problem of the sciences. Anxiety impairs the freedom of decision. Indeed, it may make such freedom impossible. Only a fearless man or woman can decide, can decide freely. The discussion of the problem of anxiety should be open to all the disciplines, not reserved to any one of them, for the great concern of science is the analysis and application of the concept of human freedom. My task, my task today is to discuss the problem of anxiety in politics, a task which is confronted with many obstacles. In contrast to the traditional disciplines, the science of politics has no method of its own. It has, in the last analysis, only a focus, namely the dialectical relation between domination and freedom. In other words, the science of politics revolves solely around a problem and uses all kinds of methods to attack this problem. However, with this approach, the political scientist runs the danger of dilettantism, a danger which he can avoid only by being conscious of his limitations and by giving hearing to authorities from other disciplines. Thus, this contribution will often consist merely in a, th in a synthesis of the results of research or perhaps in a felicitous hypothesis. But a second, even greater obstacle consists in the inadequate state of the discussion of anxiety in psychological literature. If I rely extensively on Freud in what follows, I do so not because I accept his therapeutic method, of that I understand nothing, but because his theoretical insights seem to be convincing and not refuted up to now. My lecture will have to take a position on many questions which have not yet been clarified, and it is my hope that it will move other and more competent scholars to analyze the problems I have raised. Alienation In his letters, Uber die aesthetisch Urzahang des Menschen, Schiller has magnificently described man in modern society. Man portrays himself, he writes, and what a form is presented in the drama of the modern age. Baroness here, license there, the two extremes of human decay, and both united in a single period. As Rousseau did before him, Schiller indicts civilization itself. It was culture itself which inflicted this wound on modern humanity, and this wound was, in, was inflicted on man by the division of labor. Gratification is separated from labor, means from ends, effort from, re from reward. Eternally fettered only to a single little fragment of the whole, man fashions himself only as a fragment. His indictment of modern society reaches its climax in the characterization of love. So jealous is the state for the sole possession of its servants, that it would sooner agree, and who could blame it, to share them with a Venus Cytherea than with a Venus Urania. Schiller has, of course, taken the two forms of the goddess of love from Plato's Symposi Symposium, and thus identifies Venus Cytherea with venal, but Urania with genuine love. What Schiller describes so impressively is what Hegel and Marx were to characterize as alienation. Schiller contrasts the polypus nature of the Greek states, where each individual enjoyed an independent existence and, if necessary, could become a whole, with modern society, which is one of hierarchical division of labor. Modern society produces a fragmentation not only of social functions, but of man himself, who as it were, keeps his different faculties in different pigeonholes. 
love, labor, leisure, culture, that are somehow held together by an externally operating mechanism that is neither comprehended nor comprehensible. One may, as I do, consider Schiller's, as also Hegel's analysis of the Greek state, as strongly unrealistic, and one may perhaps even see certain dangers in the glorification of Greece. Nevertheless, his analysis of modern man, pointing far beyond his age, remains valid, and it is perhaps only today that we have become fully conscious of how true Schiller's letters are. 2. In his Theo Theologisch <laughs> Jugendschriften, Hegel developed for the first time the concept of alienation. In his draft entitled Love, he defined love as the whole, as a feeling but not a single feeling. In it, life finds itself as a duplication of its self and as its unity, but this love is frequently shattered by the resistance of the outside world, the social world of property, a world indeed which man has created through his own labor and knowledge, but which has become an alien, a dead world through property. Man is alienated from himself. Since we are here not concerned with the Hegelian concept of alienation, we may pass over the development of, its, of his concept. It is equally unnecessary for us here to develop fully Marx's concept of alienation. For Marx, it is the commodity that determines human activity. That is, the objects which are supposed to serve man become the tyrant of man. For according to Marx, who thus fully agrees with Schiller, Hegel, and Feuerbach, man is a, univers man is a universal being. Man is free if he recognizes himself in a world he has himself made. But that does not happen. Since alienating labor, one, alienates man from nature, and two, alienates him from himself, his own active function, his life's activity, it alienates man from his species. The separation of labor from the object is thus for him a threefold one. Man is alienated from external nature, from himself, and from his fellow men. The relations of man to one another are reified. Personal relations appear as objective relations between things, commodities. Man, not only the worker, since the process of alienation affects society as a whole, is thus for Marx, as for Schiller, Feuerbach, and Hegel, a mutilated man. 3. But these theories of alienation are not adequate. While the principles developed by Hegel and Marx must not be given up, these theories need supplementation and deepening. Their inadequacy consists in this, that the opposed universal or nearly universal man of ancient Greece and Schiller and Hegel to the mu mutilated man of the modern world. But there is no historical form of society in which men have ever existed as universal beings. For slavery is not compatible with universality. My meaning may perhaps become clearer if I distinguish three strata of alienation. The stratum of psychology, that of society, and that of politics. We can get at the problem of alienation, and thus of anxiety in politics, only if we start with a clean separation of the three strata and concepts, in order later to bring them together again. Neither alienation nor anxiety is to be found only in modern society and only in modern man, although the different structures of society and of the state modify the forms of expression which alienation and anxiety take. The modifications are hard to determine, and I shall not attempt here to undertake a systematic analysis, but I shall try to point up, point up the problem and to make the theory somewhat more concrete by means of more or less arbitrary examples. Alienation and Anxiety 1. Freud's thesis in his Civilization and its Discontents is this. The goal towards which the pleasure principle impels us of becoming happy is not attainable. Because for Freud, suffering springs from three sources. External nature, which we can never dominate completely, the susceptibility to illness and the mortality of the body, 
and social institutions. However, the statement that society prevents happiness and consequently that every socio-political institution is repressive does not lead to hostility towards civilization. For the limitation which is imposed upon the libidinal as well as the destructive instincts creates conflicts, inescapable conflicts, which are the very motors of progress in history. But conflicts deepen with the progress of civilization, for Freud states that increasing technical progress, which in itself ought to, ought to make possible a greater measure of instinct gratification, fails to do so. There arises here a psychological leg that grows ever wider, a formulation that I should like to borrow from the cultural leg of American sociology. Thus, every society is built upon the renunciation of instinctual gratifications. Freud finds that it is that it is not easy to understand how it can become possible to withhold satisfaction from an instinct, nor is it by any means without risk to do so. If the, de if the deprivation is not made good economically, one can be certain of producing serious disorders. To be sure, according to Freud, it is conceivable that a civilized community could consist of pairs of individuals who love each other, libidinally satisfied in each other, and linked to all the others by work and common interests. If this were so, culture would not need to levy energy from sexuality. But the opposite is true and has always been true. For at bottom, Freud does not believe in this conceivable ideal. The differences between the different forms of society, which are decisive for us, do not play a decisive role for him. The renunciation of instinctual gratification and the cultural tendency towards the limitation of love operate at all levels of society. It is these renunciations and limitations which we characterize as psychological alienation of man, or perhaps even better as alienation of the ego from the dynamics of instinct. Two, still another preparatory step is necessary we have to establish the logical connection between alienation and anxiety. This is extremely difficult because the discussion of the problem of anxiety has by no means reached the clarity which would snake it, which would snake it possible, make it possible for an outsider like myself to adopt an un unambiguous position toward the various opinions. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the differences in the conception of the origin of anxiety do not have a decisive significance for my analysis, although they are, of course, highly rele relevant in other contexts. Freud himself had originally derived anxiety from the repression of libidinous impulses, and thus had seen it as an automatic transformation of an instinctual energy. This view he later modified. Others claim, on the other hand, that there is a single inborn faculty for being afraid. Rank, in his famous work, derives anxiety from the trauma of birth, and a number of analysts have tried more or less successfully to combine the various theories in many ways. The following propositions seem to me more or less acceptable. One must distinguish between true anxiety and neurotic anxiety. The difference is of considerable consequence, especially for the understanding of the political importance of anxiety. The first true anxiety thus appears as a reaction to concrete danger situations. The second neurotic anxiety is produced by the ego in order to avoid in advance even the remotest threat of danger. True anxiety is thus produced through the threat of an external object. Neurotic anxiety, which may have a real basis, on the other hand, is produced from within, through the ego. Since, ang since anxiety is produced by the ego, the seat of anxiety is in the ego, not in the id, the structure of instincts. But from the analysis of the problem of psychological alienation, it follows necessarily that anxiety, feelings of guilt, and the need for self-punishment are responses to internal threats to basic instinctual demands, so that anxiety exists as a permanent condition. The external dangers which threaten a man meet the inner anxiety and are thus frequently experienced as even more dangerous than they really are. At the same time, 
these same external dangers intensify the inner anxiety. The painful tension which is evoked by the combination of inner anxiety and external danger can express itself in either of two forms, in depressive or in persecutory anxiety. The differentiation is important because it helps us to evaluate the political function of anxiety more correctly. In the history of the individual, there are certain typical dangers which produce anxiety. For the child, the withdrawal of love is of decisive importance. On this point, there seems to be no doubt among psychologists. From the numer numerous phobias, we may learn a great deal about the relation between anxiety and the renunciation of instinctual gratification. For inhibitions are a functional gross for inhib for inhibitions are a functional restraint of the ego the ego renounces many activities in order to avoid a conflict with the id and the conscience we know that the phobic symptoms are a substitute for gratifications of the instincts that have been denied or are unattainable in other words the ego creates anxiety through repression three if I have correctly reproduced the most important results of analytical theory concerning the origin of anxiety, several important consequences for the analysis of political behavior seem to follow immediately. Anxiety can play very different roles in the life of men. That is, the activation of a, of a state of anxiety through danger can have a beneficial as well as destructive effect. We may perhaps distinguish three different consequences. A. Anxiety can play a warning role, a kind of mentor role for man. Effective anxiety may allow a presentiment of external dangers. Thus, anxiety also contains a protective function, for it permits man to take precautions in order to ward off the danger. B. Anxiety can have a destructive effect, especially when the neurotic element is strongly present. That is, it can make man incapable of collecting himself either to escape the danger or to fight against it. It can paralyze man and degenerate into a panicky anxiety. C. Finally, anxiety can have a cathartic effect. Man can be strengthened inwardly when he has successfully avoided danger or when he has prevailed against it. One may perhaps even say, although I cannot prove this, that the man who has conquered anxiety in coming to terms with a danger may be more capable of making decisions in freedom than the one who never had to seriously wrestle with a danger. This may be an important qualification of the proposition that anxiety can make free decision impossible. Anxiety and Identification Our analysis of the relation of alienation to anxiety does not yet permit us to understand the political significance of these phenomena, because it is still in the realm of individual psychology. How does it happen that masses sell their souls to leaders and follow them blindly? On what does the power of attraction of leaders over, mass, uh, over masses rest? What are the historical situations in which this identification of leader and masses is successful? And what view of history do the men, who, men have who accept leaders? One. Thus, the question concerning the essence of the identification of masses and a leader stands in the center of group psychological analysis. Without it, the problem of the integration or collectivization of the individual in a mass cannot be understood. I assume that the history of the theories of group psychology is familiar. The extraordinary difficulty in the comprehension of group psychological phenomena lies, first of all, in our own prejudices for the experiences of the last decades have instilled in us all more or less strong prejudices against the masses, and we associate with masses the epithet mob, a group of men who are capable of every atrocity. In fact, the science of group psychology began with the aristocratic prejudice in the work of the Italian Scipio Segelli, and Le Bon's famous book is completely in this tradition. His theses are familiar. Man in the mass descends. He is, as it were, hypnotized by the leader, and in this condition is capable of committing acts which he would never commit as an individual. As the slave of unconscious, i.e. for Le Bon, regress 
regressive sentiments, man in the mass is segregated into a barbarian. Isolated, he may be a cultivated individual. In a crowd, he is a barbarian, that is, a creature acting by instinct. He possesses the spontaneity, the violence, the ferocity, and also the enthusiasm and heroism of primitive beings. Critics of Le Bon, among them Freud, have pointed out that his theory, which rests on Segel and Tardy, is inadequate in two aspects. The answer to the question, what holds the masses together, is inadequate for the existence of a racial soul is unproved. In addition, in Le Bon, the decisive problem, the role of the leader hypnotist, remains unclarified. As is frequently true in social psychological studies, the descriptions of psychological states are adequate. The theoretical analyses, the answers to why, are inadequate. Two, from the outset, Freud sees the problem in the way in which we have put it, namely, as that of the identification of masses with a leader, an identification which becomes of decisive significance, particularly in an anxiety situation. And he sees in the libido the cement which holds leader and masses together, whereby, as is known, the concept of libido is to be taken in a very broad sense, to include the instinctual activities which, in relations between the sexes, force their way towards sexual union, as, a, as well as those which, in other circumstances, are diverted from this aim or are prevented from reaching it, though always preserving enough of their original nature to keep their identity recognizable, as in such features as the longings for proximity and self-sacrifice. The cement which holds the mass together and ties them to the leader is thus a sum of instincts that are inhibited in their aims. In this manner, I believe, the logical connection between alienation and mass behavior has been established. Since the identification of masses with the leader is an alienation of the individual member, identification always constitutes a regression and a twofold one. On the one hand, the history of man is the history of his emergence from the primal horde and of his progressive individualization. Thus, the identification with a leader in a mass is a kind of historical regression. This identification is also a substitute for a libidinal object tie. Thus, a psychological regression, a damaging of the ego, perhaps even the loss of the ego. Three. But this judgment is valid only for the libido charged, i.e. effective identification of an individual and a mass with a leader, and not as a matter of course, and perha perhaps not at all, for that of lovers and of small groups. Not effective identification, too, cannot be simply considered as regressive. For identification with organizations, church, army, is not always libidinally charged, McDougall's emphasis on the significance of organization must therefore be taken seriously. It is thus necessary to make distinctions. There are non-effective identifications in which coercion or common material interests play an essential role, either in bureaucratic hierarchic or in cooperative form. It seems to me to be incorrect, above all for recent history, to see in the identification of the soldier with the army i.e. in the loyalty to an organization, an actual identification of the soldier with the commander-in-chief. Surely there are examples of this. Alexander, Hannibal, Caesar, Wallenstein, Napoleon. But the commander-in-chief of the 20th century is much more the technician of war than the leader of men, and the libidinal tie of the soldier is, if I may coin the phrase, essentially cooperative, namely with the smallest group of comrades with whom he shares dangers. Thus, I would like to establish two fundamental types of identification, a libido-charged effective and a libido-free non-effective, and maintain generally, as it follows from McDougall's psychology, that the non-effective identification with an organization is less regressive than the effective identification with a leader. 
Non-effective loyalty is transferable. Personal loyalty, on the other hand, is not. The former always contains strong rationalist elements, elements or calculability between organization and individual, and thus prevents the total extinction of the ego. But I believe that one must also distinguish two types within effective identification. One may call them cooperative and Caesar Caesaristic. It is conceivable, and it has probably happened in short periods in history, that many equals identify themselves cooperatively with one another in such a manner that their egos are merged in the collective ego. But this cooperative form is rare, limited to short periods, or in any case operative only for small groups. The decisive effective identification is that of masses with leaders. It is, as I have said, the most regressive form, for it is built upon a nearly total ego shrinkage. It is the form which is of decisive significance for us. We call it Caesaristic identification. Caesaristic identification and false concreteness, the conspiracy theory in history. Caesaristic identifications may play a role in history when the situation of masses is objectively endangered, when the masses are incapable of understanding the historical process, and when the anxiety activated by the danger becomes neurotic, persecutory, aggressive anxiety through manipulation. From this follows, first of all, that not every situation dangerous to the masses must lead to a Caesaristic movement. It follows further that not every mass movement is based on anxiety, and thus not every mass movement needs be Caesaristic. Thus, it is a question of determining the historical conditions in which a regressive mass movement under a Caesar tries to win political power. 1. However, before we describe these historical situations, I may perhaps point to a clue which will frequently permit us an early diagnosis of the regressive character of such a mass movement. This clue is the, the view of history which the masses and the leaders employ. It may be called the conspiracy theory of history, a theory of history characterized by the false concreteness. The connection between Caesarism and this view of history is quite evident. Just as the masses hope for their deliverance from distress through absolute oneness with a person, so they ascribe their distress to certain persons who have brought this distress into the world through conspiracy. The historical process is personified in this manner. Hatred, resentment, dread created by great upheavals are concentrated on certain persons who are denounced as devilish conspirators. Nothing would be more incorrect than to characterize the enemies as scapegoats, as often happens in the literature, for they appear as genuine enemies whom one must extirpate and not as substitutes whom one only needs to send into the wilderness. It is a false concreteness and therefore an especially dangerous view of history. Indeed, the danger consists in the fact that this view of history is never completely false, but always contains a kernel of truth, and, indeed, must contain it, if it is to have a convincing effect. The truer it is, one might say, the less regressive the movement, the falser the, mo the, falser, the more regressive. It is my thesis that wherever effective, i.e. Caesaristic, leader identifications occur in politics, Masses and leader have this view of history, that the distress which has befallen the masses has been brought about exclusively by a conspiracy of certain persons or groups against the people. With this view of history, true anxiety, which, has, which had been produced by war, want, hunger, anarchy, is to be transformed into neurotic anxiety and is to be overcome by means of identification with the leader, demagogue, the leader demagogue through total ego renunciation to the advantage of the leader and his clique, whose true interests do not necessarily have to correspond to those of the masses. Of course, I cannot provide conclusive proof, but I, but I believe that by pointing to certain historical events, I can make clear the connection between the view of history and Caesarism. Two. 
An interesting, effective identification of leader and masses is the relation of Cola di Rienzo to the Roman people. I assume that his story is familiar, the rise of the hack lawyer, son of a Roman innkeeper and a washerwoman, to tribune of the Ros the Rosman people and dictator of Rome, his expulsion and return with the aid of the church and his assassination by the Colonna family in the year 1354. The view of history of Cola and of the Roman people was quite simple. Rome has been ruined by feudal lords. Their destruction will permit Rome to rise again to its ancient greatness. This is how Petrarca formulates it in his famous letter of congratulations to Cola. These barons in whose defense you, the Romans, have so often shed your blood, whom you have nourished with your own substance. These barons have judged you unworthy of liberty. They have gathered the, they have gathered the mangled remnants of the state and the caverns and abominable retreats of bandits. They have been restrained neither by pity for their unhappy country nor by love for it. Do not suffer any of the rapacious wolves whom you have driven from the fold to rush against, again into your, mind, into your midst. <laughs> Even now, they are prowling restlessly around, endeavoring through fraud and deceit to regain an entrance to the city whence they were violently expelled. It cannot be denied that the feudal lords, above all the Colonna and Orsini, had pursued a criminal policy. Without this element of truth, Cola's propaganda and policy would never have been successful. But fundamentally, this was a false concreteness. For even if he had succeeded in liquidating the barons, what would have been decisively improved in Rome? The historical facts, the resonance of the papal court in Avignon, the economic decay of Rome, the regrouping of class relations through the rise of the bourgeois cavalerati, all that cola could not change. It can hardly be doubted that anxiety, even purely physical fear of the arbitrariness of the barons, drove the people to cola. Cola succeeded in strengthening this anxiety by extremely skillful propaganda and achieved victory. But the leader himself must feel no anxiety, or at least must not show it. He must stand above the masses. But in this, Cola was deficient. In all other matters, his relation corresponded exactly to that of the libido-charged identification leader masses, and it is regrettable that time does not permit me to describe and, an and analyze his propaganda themes, his ceremonial, and his ritual. It was Cola's fundamental mistake that he was not enough of a Caesar. To be sure, he publicly humiliated the barons, but he did not liquidate them, whether out of cowardice, decency, or tactical considerations. But the masses of Rome expected that he would act in accordance with their view of history. He did not do this. Thus, he had to fall. I have mentioned Cola de Rienzo, because it is a marginal case in which it is doubtful whether we are dealing with a regressive or a progressive movement, that is, a movement which really has the realization of the freedom of man as its goal. 3. The eight French religious wars of the 16th century furnish excellent material for the illumination of the character of Caesaristic as well as organizational identif identifications. All three parties... Huguenots, Catholics, and politiques were faced with grave problems. The disintegration of the old society through silver inflation, loss of wealth on the one hand, enrichment on the other, the beginnings of radical changes in class relations, and the dissolution of the absolute monarchy after the death of Francis I. It is against this background that the religious wars must be understood. Their course is doubtless familiar to you. Ow. Go. Catholics and Protestants alike saw the problem of France only as a religious problem, and therefore ascribed the distress of France ex exclusively to their religious opponents. Conjectured, partly justifiably, that these opponents rep represented a great and sinister conspiracy, developed or employed theories of Caesaristic identification, 
and consistently proceeded to extirpate the opponent wherever opportunity offered. The Huguenot pamphleteer Francois Hutman, in his Tiger, saw in the Cardinal Guise a detestable monster, whose aim it was to ruin France, to assassinate the king, and to conspire with the aid of the women near the king and the high constable of France against the crown of France, the goods of widows and orphans, the blood of the poor and innocent. Calvin's theory of the secular redeemer sent by God to overthrow tyrants in the 17th century, the basis of Cromwell's leadership, became the Protestant theory of Caesarism. The Catholics, with a longer tradition of tyrannicide, developed a pseudo-democratic theory of identification, above all in the writings of the Leaguist preachers and Jesuits. In these inflammatory pamphlets, whose demagogy even surpasses that of the Huguenots, the theory of democracy is fitted out with theocratic traits. The masses of the people are integrated through the social contract in order to be identified with Henry of Guise, with the aid of the theocratic element, whoever takes the trouble to study the Eighth Religious War, the War of the Three Henrys, and the Parisian Uprising, will find there all the elements which I consider decisive. Appeal to anxiety, personification of evils, first with Henry III, then with Henry of Navarre, identification of the masses with Henry of Guise. Both positions, the Catholic and the Huguenot, are similarly regressive, while that of the politique, which Henry the Ninth was later to convert into action, or wait, no, Henry the Fourth was later to convert into action, is incomparably more progressive. Indeed, the great merit of the chief representative of the party of the politique, Jean Baudin, or Jean Baudin, consists in this. He saw the economic problems of France clearly. He understood the false concreteness of the view of history of both parties. If he championed absolute monarchy, that is, the identification of the people with the monarch, he did so because the monarch was to place himself above, above the religions that were fighting each other and to ally himself with the households of the third estate in order to save France. Despite the absolute submission to the prince which is demanded of the people, this identification contains the two rational elements which I mentioned before. Loyalty becomes transferable, i.e. the office is separated from the office holder, and the relation between citizen and state becomes rational. Thus, Bowdoin has certain justification in calling his theory a theory of the constitutional state, despite his absolutism. I believe that the French religious wars on the 16th century or of the 16th century make my thesis a little clearer that the non-effective identification with an institution state is less regressive than identification with a leader. Four, naturally, I cannot here discuss all similar situations. The religious struggles of the 16th and 17th centuries are full of such historical constructions. One need only read, for example, the terrible Calvinist fanatic John Knox in his famous first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women, and we will find there, we see our country set forth for a prey to foreign nations. We hear the blood of our brethren, the members of Christ Jesus, most cruelly to be shed, and the monstrous empire of a cruel woman we know to be the only occasion of all these miseries. The rule of the Catholic Catherine de Medici of Marie of Lorraine, the predecessor of Mary Stuart and of Mary Tudor, appears here not only as a violation of divine commandment because God has subjected women to men, but as a genuine conspiracy against the true religion. Unfortunately, John Knox had the ill luck of seeing Protestantism restored in England by a woman, and he apologized to Elizabeth in a second blast for his first attack. 5. Instead of continuing with the survey, it may perhaps be more useful to discuss five fundamental models of conspiracy theories, all of which show this sequence. 
intensification of anxiety through manipulation, identification, false concreteness. They are A. The Jesuit Conspiracy B. The Freemason Conspiracy C. The Communist Conspiracy D. The Capitalist Conspiracy and E. The Jewish Conspiracy 6. The Jesuit order is indeed defined by man as a conspiracy, and the Moneta Secreta of 1614, composed by a Polish ex-Jesuit, fulfill the need for a secret plan of operations with the help of which one can hold the order responsible for every crime and every misfortune and can stir up the masses. This has always been relatively simple in times of crisis. St. Bartholomew's Night, the assassination of Henry III by Jacques Clement, the attempt on the life of Henry IV by Barrier and Chastel, as well as his assassination by Ravignac, the English gunpowder plot of 1605, the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War, to say nothing of innumerable, less important crimes and misfortunes, were ascribed to the Jesuits. That these tales should have been believed is naturally connected with the significance of false concreteness in politics. There is some truth in many of these accusations. It is precisely in this element of truth that the danger of these views of history lies. 7. The denunciation of the Freemason is a similar matter. Thus the English believed the Jacobite conspiracies to be the work of Freemasons, the French Revolution, was ascribed to a mysterious group of Bavarian Illuminati. And this view of history, again, is closely connected with the anti-Jesuit one, since the Bavarian Illuminati had been founded by Adam Weishaupt in 1776 in order to combat the influence of the Jesuits. Again, these assertions have some truth in them. Most of the encyclopedists were Freemasons, and more than half of the members of the estates general belong to Freemasonic, Freemasonic lodges. But in this audience, surely no detailed discussion in, is needed to show that the conspiracy theory represents a blurring of history. 8. The theory of the communist conspiracy follows the same model and serves the same purposes. Thus, the Russian October Revolution is explained solely as a blankest conspiracy, embodied in Trotsky's Military Revolutionary Committee. The German Revolution of 1918 is laid to the charge of the devilish Lenin. The seizure of power by the Bolsheviks and the satellite states is traced back to sinister conspiracies in the Kremlin, and generally the relation of Bolshevism to the world is equated with that of a conspiracy of a small group against the welfare of humanity. Again, this is partly true. The October Revolution was a conspiracy, but in a definite historical situation and with an ideology. The Bolsheviks would gladly have manipulated the German Revolution of 1918, but they had neither the strength nor the intelligence to do it, nor could they, even if cleverer, have prevailed in the concrete situation. The communists in the satellite states naturally conspired, but they could come to power only because the Red Army stood behind them and because the objective situation favoured them. No conspiracy, no matter how clever, would have been of any use and was of any use in Western Europe. Nevertheless, the conspiracy theory is believed not only by the masses, but even by serious writers who strongly, under the influence of Pareto's simplistic antithesis between elite and masses, generally tend to see in politics nothing but the manipulation of the masses by elites and for whom psychology and political science are nothing but techniques of manipulation. The purpose of the theory is clear. Potential anxiety, whose concrete significance still needs to be clarified, is actualized by reference to the devilish conspirators. Family, property, morality, religion are threatened by the conspiracy. Anxiety easily becomes neurotic persecutory anxiety, which in turn can under, can under certain cir- circumstances lead to a totalitarian mass movement. 9. We could cite a great many more cases in which history was viewed with false concreteness. Especially American history is full of examples of such movements. There is, for instance, the Know Nothing Party of 1854-55 to with its hatred 
of the Irish Catholics and the German immigrants. It originated in the secret order of the Star-Spangled Banner, which was founded by native-born Protestants. They mistreated Catholics, and when asked about the order, they would answer, I know nothing. The Ku Klux Klan is better known. Fear of status loss on the part of the whites, especially of the poor whites vis-a-vis -vis the Negroes, and fear of the Pope and the Catholics were the basic factors which made this secret society into a terroristic organization from its foundation in 1867 to the present day. The Populist Party of 1892, on the other hand, was born out of an agrarian depression as a protest against the rule of the railway, industrial, and credit monopolies, and, as a pro and against the gold standard. One of its leaders developed a genuine theory of conspiracy. According to my views of the object, the conspiracy which seems to have been formed here and in Europe to destroy from the three-sevenths sevenths to one half of the metal metallic money of the world is the most gigantic crime of this or any other age. Oops. 10. In similar fashion, Bolshevism operates with the theory of capitalist encirclement, in which the capitalists as a rule are personified by Wall Street. Now again, there can be no doubt that there was a policy of, encir policy of encirclement against Bolshevist Russia, at the beginning of the revolution, but it would be fatal to believe that the terror was the consequence of the policy of intervention and of the Cold War. Possibly the policy of encirclement strengthened the terror, just as the wars of intervention during the French Revolution gave Robespierre's terror a new impetus. But the terror as a normal method of politics against the class opponent is contained in the Leninist definition of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was then extended to the party and finally to the supposedly classless society, without a visible connection with the intensity of the capitalist policy of encirclement. But the Bolshevist view of history steadily activating anxiety made possible identification with the leader Stalin and thus underpinned his Caesarist dictatorship. 11. The most important type, if only because of its immense political influence, is the theory of the conspiracy of the Jews according to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. These contain the secret plans of Jewish leaders, supposedly formulated in the year 1897, for achieving Jewish world domination by force, terror, corruption, the disintegrating influence of liberalism, Freemasonry, etc. This world domination was to be a mock democracy through which the Jewish leaders were to operate, that the protocols are a forgery prepared by Tsarist Russia or Tsarist Russians was definitely was definitively established by the Bern trial of 1934 to 35. It is equally belong, beyond question that they are essentially a plagiarism of the work by Maurice, Maurice Jolly directed against Napoleon III. Dialogue au enfer entre Michiavel et Monte Montesquieu. But if the protocols represent a forgery, and if the plans for a Jewish world conspiracy belong in the realms of mythology, where then does that kernel of truth lie, which, according to my view, is necessary to make possible the influence which anti Semitism and the protocols have had? I shall confine my analysis to Germany. But the German situation can be understood only when one becomes aware of the fact that in Germany, before 1933, spontaneous anti-Semitism was extremely weak. As early as 1942, I wrote, in opposition to an almost unanimous opinion, the writer's personal conviction, paradoxical as it may seem, that the German people are the least anti-Semitic of all. I still hold to this view today, for it is precisely the weakness of spontaneous anti-Semitism in Germany which explains the concentration of National Socialism on it as the decisive political weapon. The element of truth, if one may call it that, is first of all a religious one. The catechistic representation of the crucifixion and with, and with it the blood guilt of the Jews. But this is a thoroughly ambivalent element, for it is precisely the crucifixion of Christ which makes possible the salvation of Christians and all men. 
and the spiritually Semitic origin of Christianity is acknowledged by the church. While thus the historical religious defamation of the Jews from the basis without which anti-Semitism could hardly be activated, the catechistic representation of the crucifixion is not sufficient by itself. The existence of a total anti-Semitism can perhaps be better understood if we start from the policy of national socialism and seek to understand the role of anti-Semitism within the political system. I can sketch the problem only in its broadest outlines. Germany of 1930-33 to 33 was the land of alienations and anxiety. The facts are familiar. Defeat, a tame, unfinished revolution, inflation, depression, non-identification with the existing political parties, non-functioning of the political system. All these are symptoms of moral, social, and political homelessness. The inability to understand why man should be so hard-pressed stimulated anxiety, which was made into nearly neurotic anxiety by the National Socialist Policy of Terror and its propaganda of anti-Semitism. The goal of National Socialism was clear, the welding together of the people with the charismatic leader for the purpose of the conquest of Europe and perhaps of the world, and the creation of a racial hegemony of the Germans over all other peoples. But how was the people to be integrated despite all cleavages of class, party, religion? Only through hatred of an enemy. But how could one settle on the enemy? It could not be Bolshevism because it was too strong. The Catholic Church could not be so designated because it was needed politically, and loyalties to it were anchored too securely. The Jews remained. They appeared in the public consciousness as powerful, but were in reality weak. They were relative strangers, and at the same time the concrete symbols of a so-called parasitical capitalism through their position in commerce and finance. They incarcerated a supposedly decadent morality through their avant-garde position in art and literature. They seemed to be the successful competitors sexually and professionally. With all this, the thesis of the Jewish conspiracy had the element of truth ne necessary to permit this view of history to become a frightful weapon. It would be mistaken to want to construe a connection between the socioeconomic status of a person and his anti-Semitism. That is, to claim that the, the academically educated person is more immune than the uneducated, or the poorly paid more immune than the better paid. What is correct, however, is that there exists a connection between loss of social status and anti-Semitism. The fear of social degradation thus creates for itself a target for the discharge of the resentments arising from damaged self-esteem. This leads us to the analysis of the historical situations in which anxiety grips the masses. Situations of Collective Anxiety, Identification, Guilt I can treat these matters only in the form of theses because I deal with them in detail elsewhere. We have distinguished three strata of alienation. The psychological stratum remains no matter what social institutions man lives in. It creates potential anxiety which man in the mass attempts to overcome through ego surrender. This effective identification with a leader is facilitated by the notion of false concreteness, the theory of conspiracy. But so far, we have not yet said when such regressive mass movements are activated, that is, when potential anxiety can be activated in such a manner that it can become a cruel weapon in the hands of irresponsive leaders. In order to get at this problem, we must take into account the two other strata of alienations, the social and political. 1. Alienation of Labor it is the separation of labor from the product of labor through hierarchical division of labor which characterizes modern industrial society. Probably no one doubts that the division of labor as well as the hierarchical organization of labor has shown a steady rise since the industrial revolution of the 18th century. German romantic psychology of labor calls this the despiritualization of labor. This concept, as well as the various remedies, are dangerous. 
for they cover up the inevitability of this process of alienation which must be admitted, understood, and accepted. If this does not happen, if one refuses to take account of the inevitability of the division of labor and of the hierarchical ordering of the process of labor and attempts to spiritualize labor instead of restricting it to a minimum, then social anxiety is deepened. The attitude of the so-called new middle class salaried employees can be understood from this process. While the so-called new middle class does labor which, to remain with the language of German psychology of labor, is more despiritualized than that of the industrial worker, and although his average income probably lies below that of the industrial worker, he yet holds fast to his middle class ideology and customs. Thus he refuses to take account of the inevitability of the process and, as in Germany before 1933, becomes the social stratum most susceptible to Caesarism. <coughs> Two. In a society which is constituted by competition, the competitor is supposed to be rewarded for his effort when he is competent. That is, when he exerts himself, is intelligent, and accepts risk. There is little doubt that the principle of competition dominates not only the economy, but all social relations. Karen Horney, a representative of Freudian revisionism, claims that the destructive character of competition creates great anxiety in neurotic persons. Now, this is not convincing when genuine competition really prevails. That is, competition in which relatively equal, strong persons fight with fair methods. That is, the kind of competition which Adam Smith defines in his theory of moral sentiments as follows. One individual must never prefer himself so much even to any other individual as to hurt or injure that other in order to benefit himself through the benefit of the one should be much greater than we though the benefit of the one should be much greater than the hurt or injury to the other and again in the race for wealth and honors and permanence each may run as hard as he can and strain every nerve and every muscle in order to outstrip all his competitors but if he jostle or throw down any of them, the indulgence of the spectator is entirely at an end. It is in violation of fair play, which they cannot admit of. I cannot here undertake a social analysis to show that this ethically circumscribed competition does not exist, and perhaps never has existed, that in reality a monopolist struggle hides behind it, that, in other words, the efforts of the individual, his intelligence, his vision, his readiness to take risks, are easily shattered by the constellations of power. Behind the mask of, comp of competition, which must not necessarily have destructive effects if it rationally organizes society, there hide in fact relations of dependence. To be successful in present-day society, it is much more important to stand in well with the powerful than to preserve oneself through one's own strength. Modern man knows this. It is precisely the impotence of the individual who has to accommodate himself to the technological apparatus, which is destructive and anxiety creating. But even where genuine competition is effective, no effort will help if crises ruin the merchant. The inability to understand the process of crises and the frequent need to ascribe blame for them to sinister powers, is an additional factor in the destruction of ego. This psychological process operated in the so-called old middle class of Germany before 1933. But, to repeat, it is hard to see why fair competition must have destructive functions. 3. In every society that is composed of antagonistic groups, there is an ascent and descent of groups. It is my contention that persecutory anxiety, but one that, as we said above, has a real basis, is produced when a group is threatened in its prestige, income, or even its existence. 
i.e. when it declines and does not understand the historical process or is prevented from understanding it. The examples are too numerous to be possible to be possibly mentioned here. German National Socialism and Italian Fascism are classical examples. But not only social classes resist their degradation by means of such mass movements, religious and racial conflicts too, frequently produce similar phenomena. The conflict between Negroes and whites in the southern states of the United States, the contemporary struggles of the South African government against the natives, take place in accord with the following scheme. The anxiety of a dominant white minority that will be that it will be degraded through the economic and political rise of black people is used in propagandist fashion for the creation of effective mass movements, which frequently take on a fascist character. 4. Social alienation, i.e. the fear of social degradation, is not adequate by itself. The elements of political alienation must be added. Since I devote a separate essay to this phenomenon, I shall only point out briefly what I have in mind. As a rule, one is satisfied, above all in the American literature, with defining abstention from voting as elections at elections as political apathy. But I have pointed out elsewhere that the word apathy describes three different political reactions. First, the lack of interest in politics say the opinion that politics is not the business of the citizen because it is, after all, only a struggle between small cliques and that, therefore, fundamentally nothing ever changes, then the epi Epicurean attitude toward politics, the view that politics and state only have to supply the element of order within which man devotes himself to his perfection so that forms of state and of government appear as secondary matters. And finally, as the third reaction, the conscious rejection of the whole political system, which expresses itself as apathy because the individual sees no possibility of changing anything in the system through his efforts. Political life can, for example, be exhausted in the competition of political parties, which are purely machines without mass participation, but which monopolize politics to such an extent that a new party cannot make its way within the valid rules of the game. This third form of apathy cannot make its way within the valid rules of the game. Oh, shit. This third form of apathy forms the core of what I characterize as political alienation. Usually this apathy, if it operates within social alienation, leads to the partial paralysis of the state and opens the way to a Caesarist movement which... Scorning the rules of the game utilizes the inability of the citizen to make individual decisions and compensates for the loss of ego with identification with a Caesar. 5. The Caesaristic movement is compelled not only to activate but to institutionalize anxiety. The institutionalization of anxiety is necessary because the Caesaristic movement can never endure a long wait for power. This is precisely what follows from its effective basis. While the non-effective mass organization, such as a normal political party, can exist for a long time without disintegrating, the Caesarist movement must hurry precisely because of the instability of the cement that holds it together. The, libid the libido-charged effectivity. After it has come to power, it faces the need of institutionalizing anxiety as a means of preventing the, the extinction of its effective base by its bureaucratic structure. The techniques are familiar, propaganda and terror, i.e. the incalculability of sanctions. I do not need to discuss this here. Mont Montesquieu, building on Aristotle and Machiavelli, distinguished between three constitutional and one tyrannical government governmental and social system. According to him, monarchy rests on the honor of the monarch, aristocracy on the moderation of the aristocrats, democracy on virtue, i.e. with him, patriotism, but tyranny on fear. 
It must, however, not be overlooked, and our introductory remarks about alienation and anxiety had no other meaning, that every political system is based on anxiety. But there is more than a quantitative difference between the anxiety which is institutionalized in a totally repressive system and that which is the basis of a halfway liberal one. There are qualitatively different states of affairs. One may perhaps say that the totally repressive system institutionalizes depressive and persecutory anxiety, the halfway liberal system, true anxiety. Once the connection between anxiety and guilt is seen, it will at once become obvious that these are different states of affairs. In his Peloponnesian War, Thucydides reports the following about Sparta. Indeed, fear of their, the helots, numbers, and obst- obstinacy even persuaded the Lacedaemonians to the action which I shall now relate. The helots were invited by a proclamation to pick out those of their number who claimed to have most distinguished them or themselves against the enemy in order that they might receive their freedom. The object being to test them, as it was thought that the first to claim their freedom would be the most high-spirited and the most apt to rebel. As many as two thousand were selected accordingly, who crowned themselves and went round the temples, rejoicing in their new freedom. The Spartans, however, soon afterwards did away with them, and no one ever knew how each of them perished. With his customary psychological penetration, his greatest of all historians saw clearly the connection of anxiety and collective guilt. And then we read Plutarch's description of the terrible Cryptia, the Spartan secret police. By this ordinance, the magistrates, i.e. the ephors, dispatched privately some of the ablest of the young men in the country, from time to time, armed only with their daggers, and taking a little necessary provision with them. In the daytime, they hid themselves in out-of-the-way places, and there lay close, but in the night issued out into the highways and killed all the helots they could light upon. Here's a striking example of what we have in mind. Who does not here think of Dostovsky's The Possessed, when Stavrigin gives the following piece of advice? All that business of titles and sentimentalism is a very good cement, but there is something better. Persuade four members of the circle to do for a fifth on the pretense that he is a traitor, and you'll tie them all together with the blood they've shed as though it were a knot. They'll be your slaves. They won't dare to rebel or call you to account. This famous passage in in Dostovsky is important not only because it verifies our psychological theory, but also because it shows at the same time that the leader activates anxiety through guilt for his own advantage, not for the sake of the lead. I do not wish here to discuss the psychological theory concerning the relation of anxiety and guilt. According to Freud, man's feelings of guilt stems from the Oedipus complex. It is this aggression that the child represses and thus affects an unconscious feeling of guilt. The feeling of guilt is the superego, man's conscience. But that is precisely why the intensification of the unconscious feeling of guilt permits man to become a criminal. If one examines the Spartan example, Stavrogin's advice, the Fim murders, and the collective crimes of the SS, one may perhaps undertake the following psychological analysis. There are anxiety and an unconscious feeling of guilt. It is the task of the leader by creating neurotic anxiety to tie the lead so closely to the leader that they would perish without identification with him. Then the leader orders the commission of crimes. But these are, in accord with the morality that prevails in the group, with the Lacedaemonians, the Nihilists, the SS, no crimes but fundamentally moral acts. But the conscience, the superego, protests against the morality of the crimes, for the old moral convictions cannot simply be extirpated. The feeling of guilt is thus repressed and makes anxiety a nearly panicky one, which can be overcome only through unconditional surrender to the leader and compels the commission of new crimes. This is how I see the connection between 
anxiety and guilt in a totally repressive society. Hence, this anxiety is qualitatively different from the anxiety that is the basis of every political system. Summary. It is time to summarize the results of my analysis. 1. Psychological alienation, the alienation of the ego from the instinctual structure or the renunciation of instinctual gratifications, is inherent in every historical society. It grows with the growth of modern industrial society and produces anxiety. Anxiety can be protective, destructive, or cathartic. 2. Neurotic, persecutory anxiety can lead to ego surrender in the mass through effective identification with a leader. This Caesaristic identification is always regressive, historically and psychologically. 3. An important clue for the regressive character is the notion of false concreteness, the conspiracy theory of history. Its peculiar danger lies in the kernel of truth that is contained in this view of history. 4. The intensification of anxiety into persecutory anxiety is successful when a group class, religion, race, is threatened by loss of status without understanding the process which leads to its degradation. Five. (coughs) Generally, this leads to a political alienation, i.e. the conscious rejection of the rules of the game of a political system. Six. The regressive mass movement, once it has come to power, must, in order to maintain the leader identification, institutionalize anxiety. The three methods are terror, propaganda, and for the followers of the leader, the crime committed in common. It is my contention that the world has become more susceptible to the growth of regressive mass movements. Perhaps not so much in Germany because this after because the after effects of historical experiences still work rather strongly, despite despite all attempts to repress the memory of national socialism. You will ask me what can be done to prevent anxiety, which cannot be eliminated from becoming neurotic destructive. Can the state accomplish this? Schiller, and with this we return to our point of departure, denies this in the seventh letter. He asks and replies, should we expect this effect from the state? That is impossible since the state, as at present constituted, has caused the evil and the ideal of state The ideal state of reason cannot be the foundation of this improved humanity, but must itself be founded thereon. As educators, we may thus perhaps say that education deserves the first rank. But Schiller replies to this in the ninth letter with the question, but are we not proceeding in a circle? Theoretical culture is supposed to induce the practical, and yet the latter is to be the condition of the former. All political improvements should result from education of character, but how can the character ennoble itself under the influence of a barbarous civil polity? Surely there are also other individual solutions, such as love, but it is, after all, accidental, whether or not one experiences it, and the risk can be enormous with loss of object. Hence, there remains for us as citizens of the University of the State the dual offensiveness on anxiety and for liberty, that of education and that of politics. Politics, again, should be a dual thing for us, the penetration of the subject matter of our academic discipline with the problems of politics, naturally not day-to-day politics, and the taking of positions on political questions. If we are serious about the humanization of politics, If we wish to prevent a demagogue from using anxiety and apathy, then we, as teachers and students, must not be silent. We must suppress our arrogance, inertia, and our revulsion from the alleged dirt of day-to-day politics. We must speak and write. Idealism, as it expressed so nobly in Schiller's letters, must not be for us only a beautiful facade. It must once more become that notorious form of idealism which in the past disguised the most reactionary and anti-libertarian aims. Only through our own responsible educational and political activity can the words of idealism become history.